We'll look into the detailing of reinforcement in this video. Detailing of the reinforcement means to specify what should be the spacing between the bars and where, where can we cut the reinforcement when we do not need or what is the effective cover that we need to provide for each reinforcement. So all these details we need to provide in the drawings for construction is called as detailing of the reinforcements. But before we go into the detailing of the reinforcement, we need to understand the concepts of bond stress that develops between the steel and the concrete. Bond stress is the shear stress that exists between the steel and concrete interface which transfers the force from steel and the surrounding concrete. For example, if we have a simply supported beam like this, and we have the reinforcement in the tension side and it is loaded uniform with uniformly distributed load. We know that the bending moment shape of this beam will look like this. Now, we know that the concrete in this beam will take the compressive force and the steel in the tension side will take the tension force. However, no external load acts directly on the steel. The tension force is transferred to the steel from the surrounding concrete. And the bond stress is the shear stress that develops at the steel concrete interface which transfers this force from concrete to the steel. Now, in this beam, if we take a small segment here with length delta x and the corresponding moment um, and the corresponding moments for this section is m here and m plus delta m in the right hand side. Now, if we look into this element here we see that uh, this is the force and moment conditions on the on this section delta of length delta x as we can see on the steel um, the tension force t acts on the left hand side and the tension force t plus delta t acts on the right hand side therefore a longitudinal bond stress we denote it as sigma b must exist at the steel and concrete interface which is equal to this extra tension force delta t. So the delta t tension force should be equal to the bond stress sigma b and it is acting all over the surface of the steel so it is summation of the perimeter of the bar, bar multiplied by the length of that bar element that is delta x and for all the bars within that element. So that gives us that extra tension force delta t. Therefore, rearranging the equation, therefore rearranging the equation, the bond stress sigma b is equal to delta t over the, the surface area of the reinforcement. So therefore the bond stress is proportional to the rate of change of the force in the bar. The bond mechanism between the concrete and reinforcement steel can be classified into three different mechanisms. For a smooth round bar embedded in the concrete, the bond mechanism is mainly by the addition of the concrete and reinforcement and also the friction between the concrete and the reinforcement. But both of these effects are quickly lost when the bar is loaded in tension. Again, if this is the beam and this is your reinforcement. Now when the reinforcement is loaded in tension, it is elongated. That means it is reducing, reducing the area of the reinforcement. That means the addition and the friction between the concrete and steel is lost when it is uh, when it is subject to tension force. So for the plain round bars the bonding is not very good and hence we do not usually use the plain round bars for reinforcing uh, concrete structures. However for the deformed bars as shown here the bond is mainly due to the mechanical interlocking provided by this deformation on the steel bars. So for the deformed bars the bearing on the deformed bars transfer the force between the concrete and the steel. Equal and opposite forces act on the concrete and these forces have two components uh, ra uh, the radial component and the longitudinal component and when there is an excessive bond stress splitting of the concrete can occur because of this excessive radial stresses on the concrete the splitting of the concrete can occur if there is not adequate cover for the concrete. Such failure takes place when there is insufficient cover or too close spacing of the bars. So you can see the different kinds of splitting that can occur uh, for the reinforced concrete if 
there is not sufficient coverage provided. For example, in the first case, when the bars are too close with each other and also close to the side, you can have a splitting failure as you can see here. And when the bars are too close to the corners of the concrete beam, you can have a splitting failure like this. And if it is too close to the base of the beam, you can have the splitting failure like this as well. The load at which the splitting failure develops is affected by the minimum age distance and spacing of the bars, the tensile strength of the concrete, which in turn depends on the compressive strength of the concrete, and average bond stress along the bar. To understand the bond strength uh, between the steel and the concrete, we normally do the test called as a pull-out test. In the pull-out test, what we do is we embed a steel. Um, this is the steel, steel bar. We embed a steel bar in a concrete cylinder and then we try to pull it out from, from the concrete. So the concrete cylinder with the embedded steel bar is mounted on a steep plate and a hydraulic jack is used to pull the bar out of the cylinder. Now the tension force as you can see is applied on the steel bar um, and, and the tensile stress in the bar is shown here and the bond stress that develops along the bar is also shown here. So this is an example of the pull-out specimen. As you can see the bars is embedded into the concrete cylinder and in the second picture you can see uh, the, steep, uh, the cylinder resting on the steep plate and the bar being pulled out. For this specimen with the steel bar embedded into the concrete and applied uh, pull out force applied to the steel bar, there can be two different kinds of failure. The first one is bar can either get pull out, which is called as a bond failure, or second failure is if we have enough embedding of the steel into the concrete, the bar can yield at this point. Instead of bar being pull out, the bar will start to yield if we have enough embedding of steel into the concrete. Now we can find out what is the minimum embedment length needed to make the steel bar ill without being pulled out. So let's see how we can do that. So uh, when we are applying the tension force, the force in the bar is area of the bar multiplied by the ill strength of the bar. So assuming that the bar is yielding at that point, that means uh, force in the bar is area of the bar multiplied by the ill strength of the bar and the bond resistance developed along the length of the bar is given by the bond stress sigma b multiplied by again the surface area of the reinforcement for the embedment that is pi db which is the perimeter of the bar multiplied by the length of Im embedment. Now for the bar to yield at this point these two forces has to be equal. So if these two forces are equal, that means we have enough embedment of the bar into the concrete and the bar will start to yield at this point. So that, that means we can calculate how much is the length we need, we need the bar to be embedded into the concrete so that the bar can yield before it gets pulled out. So this equation gives us the, the minimum embedment length or the development length needed for the bar to yield and here lsy.t is called as the development length that is the minimum length required for the bar to yield without being pulled out. Now for the cantilever beam as you can see here the steel is in tension at the support. Now if we do not provide enough embedment of the reinforcement into the support the bar can get pulled out before it yields. So to bar, for the bar to get yielding at that point we need to have enough development length lsy dot t which will make the bar yield at that point and that length is called as development length now even for the simple supported beam even though the stress the tensile stress at the bars are very small at the support but we still need in enough development length so that the bar doesn't get pulled out Now the factors affecting the development length in the reinforced concrete beam is the tensile strength of the concrete, the diameter of the bar, the concrete cover that we are providing, yield strength of the bar, bar spacing, clear distance between the bars, confinement, surface coating of the bars and top or bottom bars whether the bar is at the top or bottom of the beam. AS3600 clause 13.1.2.2 gives us the equation for the development length needed for the deformed bars at yield intention. Again, um, 
as the example we saw before so if this is cantilever beam the steel at the support is yielding it should be yielding at that point so the development length needed here is lsy dot t b and which is given by this equation so um, here there are three parameters k1 k2 and k3 k1 parameter takes into account of the vertical location of the bar if the horizontal bar with more than 300 millimeter of concrete cast below the bar we take k1 as 1.3 for other cases we take at 1.0 why we do that is if this is a reinforcement beam cantilever as shown here and if the depth of concrete below the bar is greater than 300 millimeter that shows the potential of segregation of the concrete and that means we have we may have a weaker concrete on the top surface that requires a larger development length that's why it is taken as 1.3 if depth of concrete below the bar is greater than 300 millimeter for other cases we take k1 as 1 k2 takes into account the diameter effect of the diameter of the bar and K3 takes into account the spacing of the bars as well as the distance of the bar from the side and also from the base of the bar beam as well. As you can see here, um, K3 is uh, calculated as per this equation here, where CD is the minimum between half of the clear spacing between the bars, that is A by 2, or C, where C is the clear cover of the bars from the bottom or from the side so whichever is minimum that is CD and DB here is the diameter of the bar so we just plug in here K3 and K3 has to be between 0.7 to 1 and then we can find out what is the development length needed for the tension reinforcement at the yielding side now for the tension reinforcement with stress less than the yield stress uh, we can calculate the development length on pro rata basis as again for simply supported beam at the support the tensile stress at the support are less than the yield stress so we do not need to provide the development length as shown in the previous equation but we can reduce the development length uh, in a pro rata basis so we calculate what is the stress of the tension reinforcement at that point and we can find out the the development length needed based on this equation and it has to be greater than 12 times the diameter of bar. At least we have to provide the development length equal to 12 times the diameter of the bar. Now if we are using the plane bars, we need to have a longer development length because plane bar do not have the efficient bonding mechanism as the deformed bar. So the AS3600 gives the development length for plane bar as 1.5 times whatever the development length that we need for um, the deformed bars and it should be greater than 300 millimeter. If the bars are in compression, these are the equations that we have to use to find out the development length that we need uh, for the compression reinforcement. Again, the first one is uh, if the bar is at yielding, and second one if this compression stress in the compression reinforcement is less than yielding, again we use the pro rata basis to find out what is the development length needed in the compression side. Now in some cases, we may not have enough space to provide the required development length. So for example, uh, say in a simple supported beam, as you can see here, the required development length is this month. But we do not have a space to provide that development length because uh, the, the, the support ends here. So what we can do is instead of providing a straight development bar, we can bend the bar um, to form cocks that is bent at 90 degree or hooks uh, bent at 135 degree or 180 degree so when we have bar bent in cocks um, it will reduce your development length so if your development length required is lst and if we are providing a cog we we are required to provide only half of the development length required because the cog helps to develop the anchorage between the steel and the concrete so whenever there is uh, space limitation and we can't provide the required development length you can provide the cogs or hooks as well 
as you can see these are the different uh, anchors that you can provide on a reinforcement so if it is providing a cog then this um, straight portion of the cog should be at least four times the diameter of bar or 70 millimeter same applies for 135 degree and 180 degree hook as well now when we are bending the bar we need to keep in mind that uh, it shouldn't be bent too much so that it can develop stress at the bend and it can result in the corrosion of the reinforcement so designer should specify whether or not the bar could be hooked or not and all the hook deformed bars can reduce the development length hook can cause the congestion of the steel and also can trigger the rusting of the steel as well and hook shouldn't be used for a section thinner than 12 times the diameter uh, of the bar or at, at the top bars in the slabs so this chart give, gives us the diameter of the pin that we need to use to bend the bars and also what is the st uh, overall dimension of the hook or the cog as well so for example if you are using a 90 degree cog you are using a 20 millimeter bar and four times diameter of the bar pin size then um, the overall length of the bar should be 240 millimeter that means the length of this extension should be 240 millimeter for that case and also detailing also includes the cutting of the reinforcement where we do not need the reinforcement and it is called as curtailment of flexure reinforcement so curtailment of the reinforcement bar is cutting off some of the reinforcement bars in tension or compression where they are no longer needed for the strength purpose so for economic reasons where the bars are not needed we can cut it off and the factors to be considered before curtailment of the reinforcements are the development length requirements whether we are providing the adequate development length or not we have to check it and there can be some unexpected shift of the bending moment because of changing of the load so we have to ensure that um, the beam is strong enough to take into account the unexpected change in the bending moments and there, there will be a shear interaction as well so we have to make sure that that is also taken into account and development of the diagonal tension cracks as well so those those are the things that we have to take into account while considering curtailment of the reinforcement. Now looking at the same example of simply supported beam with uniformly distributed load, you know that the bending moment shape will look like this. The maximum bending moment is at the mid span which is M star. Now we designed the beam say 4 and 20 millimeter bars to take this bending moment now away from the maximum bending moment or the away from the mid span the bending moment is decreasing and at certain point your bending moment will be half of the maximum bending moment say at this point your bending moment is half of the maximum bending moment now theoretically at that point we just need to continue to reinforcement because your bending moment has decreased to half of the maximum bending moment that we designed for so at that point so at that point two reinforcement can be curtailed because um, the bending moment has decreased to half of the maximum bending moment we designed for so now that is the theoretical cutoff point but to ensure that there is a proper bonding between the concrete and the steel we need to provide adequate development length as well we have to provide adequate development length LST at the point and we can cut the reinforcement not here but after providing the you know adequate development length we can cut the reinforcements here so after a section after this section you will have only two reinforcement whereas in the middle section at maximum bending moment region we have four reinforcement so the curtainment of the reinforcement is cutting the reinforcement where we do not require them from the strength perspective A simplified approach to curtailment of reinforcement is given in AS3600 uh, and we can use the simplified approach where the live load is less than two times the dead load uh, G. So if you are looking at the negative moment region for example in a continuous beam like this one as seen in the figure above so your bending moment diagram will look like this So this is a positive bending moment and the negative bending moment at the support. 
Now for this reason, for the negative bending moment reason, your detailing can be done as shown in the figure. What it means is that when you design the reinforced concrete section for this negative moment reason, the reinforcement should be at the top because your moment is negative. So for example, if the steel area required from your flexor design is AST minus at the maximum moment reason at this point, then what the clause says is that at least a quarter of the total area must extend over the full span. So at least a quarter of this total reinforcement, that is 0.25 AST, should at least go up to the whole length of the beam. Even though there is no negative moment here, but still at least 25% of the total area that you computed should go up to the whole length of the beam, full span. And at least half of this area AST, that is half of AST minus here should go at least to the 0.3 ln from the face of the beam. So from the face of the beam at least up to the 0.3 ln, the where ln is the clear span between the beams. So it should go up to 0.3 ln and you can cut some bars there. And for the, for the 0 0.2 ln reason we should have full reinforcement that you calculated here AST minus you, that should have the full reinforcement and it should pass the face of the support as well. And now for the positive moment reason again um, for, for, for the bending moment shape that we draw before. Now for the positive moment reason here So the, uh, the steel cartilment can be done according to this figure. So if you design a reinforcement for this positive bending moment and you calculate the area of reinforcement required is AST plus, which is at the bottom of the um, beam. Now that is the full area of reinforcement that you have to provide for the maximum positive bending moment here. And what the clause says is that at least half of the steel area must extend into the simply support and beyond the support face by LST or in general 12 times the diameter of the bar plus a cog. That means if you are if you need AST area at the maximum moment reason in the center, at least half of the steel area must extend into a simple support and should extend by the development length LST or in general 12 times the diameter of the bar or and plus provide a cog here. And at least quarter of the steel that you computed must extend into the continuous support so and beyond the support face as well. And the full reinforcement AST that you calculate for the maximum moment reason should continue up to 0.1 ln of the face support. So this full reinforcement should continue up to 0.1 ln from the face of the support. So apart from that you can cut the reinforcement um, to ma match this detailing requirement. Now sometimes we might need to join the two reinforcement as well because the reinforcement comes in certain sizes so if the length of the reinforcement is not adequate um, then we might have to join the reinforcement as well. So splicing is joining of the reinforcement bars to give the continuity. The general requirement of splicing is that the reinforcement should be spliced only where the required and permitted by the drawing or specification. That means we cannot join the bars, we cannot splice the bar at the site. We can do it only when it is mentioned in the drawing itself. Splicing should take into account ease in placement of the concrete. So we shouldn't go for uh, too many splices because that will congest the uh, reinforcement case and it will be difficult to place the concrete. There are three different kinds of splicing. One is lap splice, where the reinforcement are overlap with each other. And another one is we weld the reinforcement together. And the third one is there is we use the mechanical connectors to connect two reinforcements. The first one, as you can see here, is a lap splice, where we are lapping two uh, reinforcement together. And the second one, as you can see, is the welding. So weldings often can be very tricky at the side because we may not have access uh, to the place where we need to join the reinforcement and also we need to carry um, heavy equipment for welding as well so that can be very tricky as well and the third one is a mechanical connector as you can see we are using a mechanical connector here to join two reinforcement one and two we are joining using this reinforcement now if you look closely you can see that this um, this specimen has been subjected to tensile test and you can see that there is a yielding of the reinforcement here. What it means is that the, the connector is stronger than the reinforcement itself. And these are examples of the um, 
mechanical connectors again sometimes we can grout um, the mechanical connectors as well so you can see that we are joining two reinforcements and the grout is used to fill that void between in, in inside the connector as well and similarly the example is um, the mechanical connector for columns now when we are using the lap splicing or flexure reinforcement um, so lap splicing is basically we are overlapping two pieces of reinforcement bar to form a continuous line so we can have two different kinds of lap splices one when it is a contact lap splice that is two reinforcement are in contact with each other and they are tied with wires and the second one is non-contact lap splice where they are not touching with each other but they, they have space between the two reinforcement so the first one as you can see is a contact lap splice where both of them are overlapping and touching with each other the second one is non-contact there is a space between the two uh, overlapping um, and there is a space between the two bars um, but the code limits that the clear space between these two bars should not be greater than 150 millimeter or one-fifth of the lap length required now AS3600 clause 13.2.2 gives us the length of the lap required when we are when we are splicing the reinforcement as you can see in the wide elements like slabs or walls or flange beams uh, the tensile lap length that is the tens in the tension side the lap length required is denoted as lsy.t.lap it is k7 multiplied by the development length that we calculated and it should be greater than this parameter and K7 is taken as 1.25 when uh, the area of reinforcement that we provide is less than uh, two times the area of reinforcement required and or taken as one when the area of reinforcement that we provide is greater than two times the area of reinforcement required. And for the beams and columns, um, the tensile lap length that is lsy.t.lap is given by these three equations and whichever is greater will be taken as the length of the lapping required.